Are you ready for the big leagues, but you don't know how to get the word out? Being a podcast guest and sharing your ideas and expertise can establish you as an industry thought leader. The PodConnects Guest Marketplace is your introduction to podcast hosts sharing the good word in plant medicine and the world of wellness. Sign up at PodConnects.com to have your profile sent to more than 60 of the top cannabis podcasters who are ready to speak with the leaders who are shaping the ever-changing cannabis industry. I use the PodConnects Guest Marketplace to shop for interesting guests for my show. So if you're ready to shine, go to PodConnects.com and join the Guest Marketplace today. I'll see you there. It's only entertainment. Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. Today, we've got some great guests today. Let me bring them on one by one. We've got uh, quite a show for you. So we're going to try to get through this the best we can. There's a lot of scandals in the cannabis industry. To help us get through that is LaTanya Moore. Uh, we've also got... Sharika Gadsen, uh, Blooming Bar- Barristers, Blooming Barristers, they are uh, a legal consulting resource. They're specializing in cannabis. Their mission is to empower cannabis entrepreneurs and businesses with legal and business tools uh, uh, in, in the dynamic cannabis industry. So, ladies, I appreciate you being with me on the Talking Hedge. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we're going to get to dive right into this. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, appreciate it. Um, so, so there's three of you, and there's a lot going on. So I'm going to uh, kind of just dive into each one of these topics, and then you are the subject matter experts in your own law. And so you're going to kind of just give uh, the audience your uh, best case scenario on on how to uh, navigate this this cannabis industry, starting with top five cannabis cannabis scandals of 2022. So last year there was uh, quite going on, quite a lot going on, starting with MedMen. So MedMen needed some money. They decided to sell to some New York assets to Ascend Wellness. Uh, The price was agreed upon. seemed a little bit low considering how promising that New York market looked at the beginning of 2022. And then at the top, uh, the top management at MedMen at the time changed. Uh, So they went through uh, that price uh, was a bit cheap. They tried to back out of the deal. And then after some court battles, uh, there was some accusations of political pandering and then ascend one. Uh, but the developing buyers had, had buyer's remorse. There's a New York market sort of looking a little like a hot mess. And so they said, no, thanks. Medman was left with its New York assets, found itself stuck with the property that few desired, even as it put them back on the shelf to sell. So, uh, ladies, should Medman have taken the original price and closed the deal before New York market unraveled for MSOs? Any opinion on that? Definitely. Let me unmute my mic. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for again for having us on the show. I'm Christina, one of the uh, third queens of our wonderful illustrious organization. Um, definitely, foresight in this industry is everything. Even when you have new states that pop into the market, uh, they can become oversaturated quick. There's a a element of that green rush greed, wherein individuals are quick to want to move and be in a market first to be able to move product and they may try to undervalue and price product uh, which unfortunately affects the market trend and profit margins for it. It happened in the state of Michigan where I primarily practice at and these promising states very early in have a unfortunate uh, short run at the top of the market despite even premium product. So definitely Mid Mal, if they looked at the states like Oklahoma, Michigan, and some of the other sister states that just got in and have already been facing some price point issues, should have kind of grabbed the money and ran. Um, if they could have negotiated a little bit more, but I wouldn't have let, let it gone to the point of um, litigation. And that is also a lesson learned in these, these new markets and these new contracts. Put an arbitration clause. Let's try to stay out of court, get this matter settled. Get back in business and make your money. It sounds like good advice. Yeah, take the money and run. You got first mover advantages. Do something with it. Uh, looking at uh, Parallel, which used to be called Suterna Wellness, found itself in the crosshairs with some investors. <laughs> see the uh, according to investor sentiment, Parallel could not take on more debt, but it did. And so those investors claim that the company's CEO was being uh, untruthful uh, to them. 
So ultimately lost his job as a result of the lawsuit and the challenges ongoing and parallel defaulted on that debt. And despite that, in Florida, you can still go into a parallel cannabis dispensary and buy medical cannabis. So do only suckers pay their debts? Will MSOs and Canadian cannabis survive with the amount of IRS debt or 6% just cheap capital? I'd like to take a stab at that because I have a lot of opinions on that, but I'll, I'll keep it brief. Um, again, it, it goes back to that element of greed. So everyone with the anticipations and the performance that they're expecting on these, these, these projects, unfortunately, you have individuals that overpay themselves, they take the debt, they buy themselves big houses, nice cars and boats, and they're not being conscious of the sales tax that are required. Sales tax must be in compliance, you must pay it before you even get into renewal. And that depends on if your state allows you to, to have um, uh, do some type of repayment structure. You gotta pay back these debts. The problem is, is keeping the licensing, staying out of shareholder disputes, and and keeping it going. Now, uniquely in Florida, uh, where you have a lot of Florida flight to other states to be able to engage in a commercial market on a recreational matter, um, you the structure in Florida only allows so many people to be able to take advantage of it. So. My opinion on that is kind of a hit or miss with regards to Florida. While you can do something in Florida, while it was a problem elsewhere, um, is uh, just a just a again a, a element of foresight and some judgment maybe on the parties engaging in the business. I hope I answered that question right. <laughs> just my opinion. Yeah, uh, let's move on to high times though, because uh, that's kind of a a big company that's fallen from grace. So they owed lenders $28 million. hasn't stopped the company from going on an acquisition spree. It bought Moxie Holdings in a consumption lounge last year, paid for the deals despite defaulting on its debt. High Times owes $5 million in back rent for a lease agreement it got stuck with when it bought some dispensaries from Harvest Health. Uh, the company extended its stock offering, even though it can't sell any stock until it updated its financials with the SEC. And if all that wasn't enough, High Times found itself embroiled in a stock promotion scheme with a fraudulent newsletter writer based in Florida. Do you guys have any opinions about uh, why the SEC has decided not to act against High Times yet? Seems like a fragrant file to me, but um, I don't really know a whole lot about uh, law. Any advice on um, on on any of that? <laughs> It, it actually could be that it, it's not that they haven't decided to there. They may be looking into how deep this goes, because that's also what happens. Right. Like oftentimes it may not be an, an immediate enforcement action. Uh, they may very well be having talks behind the scenes and they just have not actually filed an enforcement action yet. And so with when you're when you're dealing with that, the the other the other thing is we don't know exactly what the investor agreement says. Right. We don't know exactly what what the investors are necessarily calling foul as far as to the SEC. So my suspicion is that they probably are investigating and they probably are investigating quietly because they are going to want to see how far is this going? Because you have to remember, they have a quiet they've made other acquisitions they're looking at these other deals. All of those things typically happen before they come forth with an enforcement action because they're going to want to uh, actually cast a wider net. That's my suspicion. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good point. point. And another thing that High Times can do to get out of debt, have more have more can of cup events. Yeah. Those draw out a lot of people. Uh, people like to always unveil their product, uh, be able to tote that they were awarded or acknowledged for having the best strand or the best uh, concentrate, the best dab, whatever. Uh, High Times has an ability to, to reach out to the public, get people involved. They have a, lot, a large subscribership. They should be able to uh, maybe hopefully fundraise some more money and get rid of those debts. Yeah, in an ideal world. Moving on to Dutchie, those co-founders found themselves dumped by their own company via board coup. The founders went um, into the flight thinking that they had a majority voting, or sorry, they, they went into a fight thinking that they had a majority um, voting power. The board fired one and changed the balance and then fired the Dutchie founders and put themselves in charge. The brothers are suing, saying that the board didn't have that power and that they should be reinstated. They believe that uh, the board believes that they are in the right and will bring better leaders to the company. 
what advice, if any, do you have regarding implementation of an advisory board or board of directors? Both. <laughs> you have to always have a check and balance when you are dealing with boards. That That's the first thing. The other thing, too, is founders oftentimes feel like they are invincible. But you bring on a board to make sure that the they're fiduciaries. So they have to be looking at the health of the company. They have to be thinking about who is protecting the shareholders. And I think that in a situation like this, that's exactly what you what you have to do. You must have a board in place, especially when you're doing something like this. You can have an advisory board. But here's the thing. I, I really would like to see more information in the documentation because it does sound like, well, let me say this. I don't know who was advising them as far as the founders. Uh, but I would think that they would not have a situation where the board could actually come in and make this type of unilateral decision with without it. Like typically that that's not a typical situation. Uh, so I would think that the the brothers probably do have some type of recourse in this matter. It really comes down to what's going to be best for the company. But if the board overreached, I think it probably will definitely be overturned. But to answer your question directly, I think you have to have an advisory board. You want to make sure that they do have some teeth. But at the same time, typically founders that are savvy, they are going to reserve uh, they're going to reserve some type of fail safe, right? Where they're not in this situation. Yeah, same thing happened to Steve Jobs, though. I mean, if you've got an activist investor who can do whatever they want to do, it, it can get hairy. Um, that pretty much rounds out the, the top five cannabis scandals of 2022 uh, from last year. Um, we're going to skip this tip jar where Cure Leaf uh, basically stole their employees' tip jars, arguing that. Uh, they told their employees not to put the tip jar out, but they did it anyways. And so they stole their tips. So if you guys got an opinion about that, put those opinions in the show notes. But we got to move on to cocaine. So uh, this is weird. Legal cocaine from the cannabis industry. I'm not talking about canna bumps. Canna bumps was this terrible idea where they had this snortable cocaine cannabis concentrate. Terrible look, terrible idea. But to make matters worse, there's a BC premier uh, that's uh, basically got, uh, everyone's astonished. Health Canada approved a process and the process happened to be the manufacturing of cocaine, but whoever was reading it didn't know what they were reading. I'm assuming, I have no idea. Um, so as a result, is this a result ladies of, of failed regulation? Was it too complicated? Is this lack of regulatory expertise? How did this happen? Do you know? I, I, I definitely side on the, the, the idea that this is, Terrible regulation. This is this is the same issues you kind of see that comes up with the Delta Eight, Delta Nine, where um, the, the manufacturers of it, of course, don't feel it should be regulated by your local marijuana uh, state regulation agencies or whatnot. But there is a health concern. Um, I think anything that goes from digestion or or whether edibly or something smokable to 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 snorting. Um, raises an alarm for me personally. And my concern, of course, is now we look at um, further compliance issues for our clients that engage in the industry. So definitely, I think that that should be reviewed um, in any state um, that seeks to uh, allow this type of product to make it its way onto the shelves for consumers. Yeah, pretty wild that it happened. Um, let's go back to a high times story. Um, high times got kind of dumped on this, but this is about social equity. Um, and, and ultimately, I want to ask one of you ladies about the importance of social equity in cannabis. If there's recommendations for applicants right now in Washington, 10 years into it, we finally opened up 44 applicants for retail for social equity, literally a decade into it. And so there's got to be some recommendations you have for those folks based on this scandal of a San Francisco dispensary CEO alleges foul play in a high times pot shop deal. Long story short, there was an owner in Washington who sold to Arizona based Harvest Health. Then they went into that's the, the owner of Washington based Have a Heart, took the money from Harvest Health and then went into uh, California with a social equity applicant and then paid the social equity applicants business partner to get out and the, and the main person didn't really know and so his business partner was like i got the money we're done 
And so then there was this infighting and then now there's a lawsuit and then high times was like, why? I didn't know what was going on. So there's all of this crazy, crazy stuff going on. Um, obviously there's there's social equity is important, but it seems to be just a vehicle for more scandals. Do you have any recommendations for social equity applicants and how to not get screwed? I'm passionate about the social equity component. So I'm just going to ask my fellow blooming barrister, should I address this one? Um, again, many, many opinions on this. First of all, um, let's just be realistic. Um, the idea of diversifying cannabis industry to the social equity um, programs are great, but the reality is still that a social equity applicant may not have funding. So how does that look getting into bed with someone, asking them to maybe put two, three, four million into a business where you don't bring in any capital and then you have to maintain a majority of interest? So, and then how do you stay from a very predatory type of agreement? Most states have legislation that requires the social equity partner to be at the table and to be able to eat for at least two or three years before they can divest their interest. I think that's the extent essentially to be able to protect the uh, the social equity partner from essentially being bought out too fast or appearing that they were used to be able to put themselves on a priority queue of licensing. Um, so I would definitely advise to any social equity partner um, though it may be great to want to sell your interest and you should have the right to do that, but to, for the integrity of the programs, hang in there a bit. Um, they should adopt at least a minimum threshold, two, three years of being in a business. And then if they decide at that point they want to uh, sell their interest to the capital funder or to the other partners that are at the table, uh, it's free enterprise. They should be able to do that. The idea of the social equity program is to make sure you have an opportunity to partake. It doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be a lifetime venture. Um, and it also should just ensure the safeguards to make sure that you're not being taken advantage of and, and essentially being the token um, um, the quote unquote black token uh, to uh, licensure um, for non minorities or non or, or for non women owners. So uh, just make sure those agreements are tight. They're not predatory in nature. Um, the language should also of the joint venture agreement should express how um, you understand this fully. You've had a lawyer look at it, and that should meet the state minimums, and and then they should be okay. But if if I'm a social equity applicant and I have the opportunity to partner with someone and then a year or two later, someone wants to buy me out for some seven or eight figure deal, I'm taking it. And it shouldn't be that I was taking advantage of or being used for it. The whole point is for us to, is for the social equity applicant to be able to um, um, take advantage of the market, regardless if they are operating the business from day to day or merely a capital venturist themselves looking to make a profit. Yeah, this uh, switch um, focus to IP and trademarks regarding false claims. The most recent story being uh, Raw. Raw stop uh, was was asked to stop making false claims about its papers. Um, all kinds of issues going on with that. Um, they have natural, unbleached, um, unrefined, and they they are not able to really make any of those claims anymore. And that's just kind of the the beginning of, of many issues that that I've seen over the last 10 years and that new emerging markets will see, um, including, you know, Mars they and Wrigley, they just won a lawsuit against cannabis companies selling Skittles trademarks. So they think it's like neat or, or cool or whatever to copy stuff, but it's a trademark infringement. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty naive and it's pretty silly. Um, but we see it all the time. So I'm curious with IP and trademark infringements, how do you rebound when your brand is allegedly based on deceit and lies? And as two part question, um, is the immediate brand recognition worth it? Um, I think one of the ways that um, a company can rebound after um, being accused of infringement is um, either one, um, taking a personal, doing an honest assessment and asking themselves, um, do we have the money to fight this? And um, are we actually wrong? And what's the cost of rebranding? Um, and rebranding is usually when you're going up against a larger company that has already um, has a very popular uh, brand and is easily recognizable in the market. Um, you want to go ahead and most more than likely rebrand. Otherwise, you are going to um, have to pay uh, a lot of money 
to uh, defend yourself against a company that probably doesn't want to be associated with you. Um, it's not likely that a company that can specifically market to children, Skittles, uh, wants to be associated with a brand that cannot market with Skittles, well, cannot market the way Skittles can to children, and also um, is pushing a brand that is um, confusing um, to consumers. Um, and so rebranding is um, most more than likely going to have to be the option for um, a company being accused of infringement. And um, if there's a possibility at all to um, uh, an agreement to um, uh, to coexist, uh, that should have been addressed um, very early on. You don't want to uh, ask someone who is suing you. Uh, well, maybe we can coexist, especially again when the um, the products are very adverse to one another. Moving on to some some investor schemes that with peer to peer investing, kind of being more well known and, and individuals being able to just go and uh, Kickstarter, for example, and do things like that. There was a Washington based farm, a uh, cannabis farm that is at the target of a $4.8 million Ponzi scheme. The owner of Green Acre Pharma allegedly violated federal laws, security laws with promising of enormous profits from the equity of his cannabis business. Well, folks, that's uh, red flag. Number one, enormous profits in the cannabis industry. Like, you know, uh, so what's the due diligence, I guess, for first time investors or just people looking at, at uh, peer to peer lending and wanting to get in the pot stocks and the craze and everything you guys got any, um, advice for them? Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that you have to understand with the investing period is you need to understand the industry. You need to have a clear understanding of the opportunity that is being presented and you need to be able to understand, is this a realistic return? I think that the average individual, which a lot of these peer to peer investment opportunities target, right? They target the not so savvy investor because accredited investors typically will know uh, and they're going to either do the due diligence themselves or they're going to have someone do it. The, the reality of it is you need to you need to understand what the disclosure documents are, are actually saying. Right. Now, there, there are some platforms that are a lot more sophisticated than, say, a Kickstarter, right, or an Indiegogo. They, there are other platforms that are, that are a lot more sophisticated. Um, they actually have a higher level when it comes to disclosure. You know, you're talking about equity versus donation and so on and so forth. But in, in the equity space where you are expecting a return on your investment when you are a part of peer-to-peer -peer funding, you really need to have a good handle on the industry and what is this person doing within the industry and what is the typical rate of return. That way you can make a, an informed decision about whether or not this is something that sounds like it's too good to be true. Now, you will have some investors that absolutely know it's too good to be true, but they may take a risk to get a to get <laughs> to get a big return. But they understand the scheme and they understand that this is something that is probably a little bit too good to be true, but they may be willing to risk it so that they could get a big return. So this other story out of uh, Washington State uh, with the. The caption, fake cannabis billionaire Justin Castillo pleads guilty in a $35 million fraud with recommended prison terms of 10 years. So the owner of this Washington-based hemp extract was charged with three counts of securities fraud, 22 counts of wire fraud, and in another scam, fraudulently diverted nearly $4 million from three cannabis companies that paid for banking services from another one of his companies called Pacific Banking Core. Um, do you have any recommendations for gajapreneurs getting legitimate banking accounts? Wow, that that's really, really tough in the cannabis industry. I think that we are going to start to see that that is where people are going to probably be taken advantage of probably more than any other area because banking is so sparse in the industry is very difficult uh, to it, definitely to go to a major bank if you're if you're doing anything. And so then you have to ask yourself, is this particular financial institution that I'm looking at, are 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 they strong? You know, we've seen recently. Right. First of all, you need to understand banking because we just saw, you know, some recent events 
uh, that have now rocked the investment world and it kind of shouldn't have happened. Right. And so you, you really have to understand, but I think that in the cannabis industry, honestly, it's, it's very, very difficult because the options just are, are just not there. Speaking of, of lack of options, bankruptcy, like if, if things, you know, do go really bad, a lot of times you have this protection called bankruptcy protection. And yet that's not available for schedule one, you know, drugs like cannabis, unfortunately. Um, so if or rather when um, those in the cannabis industry get bankruptcy protection, how would that bankruptcy protection impact the investing landscape and industry overall? Um, well, I don't think that it would impact it any further than that cannabis investment is high risk. And any investor agreement, just piggybacking a little bit on your previous question, should include such language. Any, any investor agreement, because you are providing shareholders uh, a security interest, needs to have anti-fraud clauses. And they specifically for accredited and non-accredited investors need to have that language so that they understand that what they're investing in um, is subject to so many different factors, such as bankruptcy. Sustainability is an issue for every cannabis business owner, um, being able to keep your doors open a year from the time that you opened them, um, to crop failure, to other type of regulatory changes, to market trend changes. A lot of times that's what we've seen happen, that at the time of licensure and opening the doors, uh, the price per pound of flour was one thing and then significantly changed four or five, six months later, which makes it a little bit difficult to honor the investor representations. So now um, in, in light of potentially a bankruptcy protection, a trustee would then have to be able to balance the representations, the expectations of the investors uh, aligned with the debt and how to properly liquidate assets. Um, but for any company, because bankruptcy is an issue, um, every agreement should have some type of dissolution clause um, that would explain what would happen if the company had to essentially dissolve itself and, and fold over. So not necessarily re re relying upon, excuse me, on statutes that basically say how a company should dissolve, but what to do with the assets without the bankruptcy protection should also be mentioned maybe in certain operating agreements. That is something that people may want to consider and of course have counsel properly uh, provide the proper language and the right type of provisions or terms to be able to ensure those kind of protections in their agreement. And, and then again, operating in transparency and providing further insurance to investors. Great. Uh, Sharika, are you seeing, what are you seeing out there? Um, what's currently an opportunity in the industry that you're seeing from your clients or your point of view? Um, are you seeing valuations plummeting? Um, are investors looking for something specific? Uh, how are you guys at, at Blooming Barristers helping in that process? So what are people looking at or for and, and what are you guys doing to, to kind of help? I mean, we actually have a pretty diverse um uh, we have diverse requests from um, from clients. We have clients who are looking to be investors. We have clients who are looking to um, own their own dispensaries. We are seeing clients who want to be cultivators. Um, I mean, the, um, the there's a lot of opportunities um, in the industry. And so, um, you know, from every um, aspect of uh, how can um, I transfer uh, my current skills into the cannabis industry. We're seeing that as well, even, you know, transportation. Um, and so, um, you know, it's not um, just a, a, this is not a, a, a singular industry. Um, any um, avenue that an individual can get into um, and uh, capitalize on this billion dollar industry, they're trying to find their way into, um, you know, one of the, um, you know, even, um, you know, we had a, a uh, recent conversation where uh, we realized the importance of even the real estate, um, because as an entrepreneur, you have to find um, location is important. Um, and so even that became um, another avenue of 
how someone could translate their real estate um, experience into bringing it into the cannabis industry. So it really varies. Yeah, it does. Um, okay, last last question for you, ladies. Um, open to to whoever. What do you see for the future of the cannabis industry? And again, how is Blooming Barristers preparing for that future cannabis uh, vision? Wow, I think it. I think it. It's it's so it's so new. It's so vast. I know that that for us, um, that what what we're very uh, cognizant of is being a an advocate for the people who want to get in this industry but may not have equal footing. So we are personally looking at uh, bringing investment dollars and matching them with clients that we know or people that we know that have the capability, they meet the, th the, meet the threshold. Uh, we are doing a lot of educational sessions about understanding the industry from a legal and a compliance standpoint, not just for application processes, but also for investors who are looking at getting into this industry and how to uh, how these can these application candidates, for example, can avoid the pitfalls. And so, like Sharika mentioned, she mentioned a, a couple of industries we know and we've been looking very heavily into transportation. We've been looking very heavily into skilled labor because that that's the other thing, real estate. You know, one one of the things that, that we've personally seen is that there are people that are ready to go only to find out that their location, unfortunately, because someone got the license before them, now they have to find yet another location because they're not the requisite, let's say, 1,000 feet from, you know, a, another facility that has gotten the license. Like, it's, it's a lot of different intricacies. And so for us, we feel that these niche areas are where we can be most effective uh, for our clients moving forward. All right. Um, we'll have your LinkedIn information in the show notes. Um, but where can they find you at? Where is Blooming Barristers? If anybody's got any questions, if they want to hire you or talk to you guys, where can they find you guys at? They can go to our website, www.bloomingbarristers.com, and there they can uh, contact us directly and we'll hop on a call. Okay, perfect. And I will have their uh, LinkedIn um, uh, contact information in the show notes as well. But I think with that, we're going to have to roll this one up. So I want to thank my guests, Latanya Moore, Christina McPhail Stockdale, Sharika Gatson with Blooming Barristers. They are a legal and consulting resource specializing in cannabis. Ladies, thanks again for being on The Talking Hedge. Thanks for, having, thank you for having us. Thank you. I'm, I'm Josh Kate. This is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, or don't, and I'm out. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out and check out these other videos that we've got. Thanks for listening to today's show. To check out more great cannabis podcasts, go to podconnects.com. Here's a preview of one of our other shows. I'm Joyce Gerber, the creator and host of the award-winning podcast, The Kenna Mom Show. And we are on a mission to enhance the impact women have on this industry as business professionals, healthcare providers, policy advocates, caregivers, moms, by sharing and preserving their stories of love and kindness, wisdom, and hope. I am so grateful to have found my tribe of Kenna podcasters right here on Pod. Connex, and look forward to our work of crushing the stigma around cannabis and caregivers and building this new industry together.